On the 10th of July 1856, a genius was born. Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American, would go on to discover and innovate some of history's greatest inventions. Without Tesla, we would not have access to electricity like we do. Tesla designed alternating current electricity, the system used across the earth today. He created the Tesla coil, which is still used in radio technology today. His inventions include, but are not limited to, dynamos, which are electrical generators similar to batteries, the induction motor, he discovered radar technology, x-ray technology, remote control, and the rotating magnet field, the basis for most alternating current machinery. He designed the first hydroelectric power plant and laid the foundation for wireless technologies with his Tesla coil. Tesla also invented many things that were a huge threat to the satanic cabal elite. He invented the death ray, a device capable of generating an intense targeted beam of energy that could be used to dispose of enemy warplanes, foreign armies and anything else you rather didn't exist. The Death Star in Star Wars riffs on this invention. He invented something called an oscillator, a device that when he attached it to an office nearly shook down the entire building and everything around it. In other words, a device that can deliberately cause earthquakes. Apparently, Tesla destroyed it with a hammer. With funding from Illuminati puppet J.P. Morgan, Tesla designed and built Wardenclyffe Tower, a gigantic wireless transmission station. Morgan thought Tesla was designing him a wireless tower that could transmit messages across the world. Tesla, however, had other ideas. He intended it to be the source of transmitting free, wireless energy throughout the world. Imagine the Illuminati cabal's panic. No more fossil fuels and oil. They would never permit Tesla to disrupt a major branch of their control over the people. So Morgan stopped the funding and the project ended in 1906. Interestingly, he also invented a flying craft. Very similar in design to what we call flying saucers or have come to know as a UFO. It was to be powered by free energy and met the same fate as Wardenclyffe Tower. The aviation and motor car industry was just too profitable to the Illuminati cabal. Most importantly out of all his contributions to humanity is the Tesla coil. Tesla used it to study fluorescence, x-rays, radio, wireless power and electromagnetism in the earth and its atmosphere. Tesla understood that the Earth itself is magnetic and that it can generate electricity or electromagnetism by utilizing frequencies as a transmitter. He famously said, If you want to find the secrets to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. And Tesla discovered free energy by figuring out the exact electromagnetic frequency of the Earth itself. The Earth's electromagnetic frequencies was predicted by physicist Winfred Otto Schumann and would later be named the Schumann Resonances, a spectrum of peaks in the low frequency of Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum. The Earth's fundamental frequency, we are told, is 7.83 Hz. Frequency is the number of occurrences of a repeating event per unit of time. Frequency is measured in Hertz, which is equal to one occurrence of a repeating event per second. It is used as an important parameter in science and engineering to specify the rate of oscillation and vibration of a specific phenomena, such as audio waves, radio waves and light waves. We are indoctrinated with the heliocentric globe life from very early on in our education. And although we are taught about the importance of electromagnetism in physics class, it is usually in the context of engineering, of building motors and electrical systems. What is less emphasized in our education, however, is the inextricable relationship between electromagnetic frequencies and vibrations with all living matter. At this stage in the series, I know I have your attention and you are probably warming to the reality that our Earth is a flat plane and not a globe. But our globe indoctrination is so thoroughly established that you are probably still imagining the Big Bang as the Earth's beginning, and that the Sun and Moon are giant spheres spinning above us locked in some kind of orbit depending on gravity. 
So I need to show you the mechanics of how this is all possible in the first place. We will leave the why for later. The best place to start is where we left off. We spoke about the firmament and there being water above. We explored the notion that the stars and planets are not spherical balls of rock and burning gas, but dancing glimpses of light interacting with the waters above the firmament. Japanese scientists Masuro Emoto came up with an innovative new way to capture the form of water. He titled this work, Messages in Water. Emoto would take samples of water in petri dishes and freeze the water at minus 25 degrees. After a few hours, Emoto would analyze the frozen water under a dark field microscope with photographic capabilities in a lab at a constant temperature of minus 5 degrees. Emoto tested out different audio frequencies and human sound vibrations on each sample. He focused on the way human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas and music affect the molecular structure of water. Let's look at his results. This photo shows the beautiful geometric design of the Shimanto River, the last clean stream in Japan. Notice the beautiful geometric form, similar to that of a snowflake. This one is of Mount Cook's glacier water in New Zealand. This is a photo from the fountain at Lourdes, France. This one, however, is from a highly polluted river. Look at the comparison of polluted water with clean river water. Amoto decided to see how music affected the shape of water. He placed water between two speakers for several hours while playing different music. Here is Beethoven's Pastorelle. This one is Bach's Air on the G-String. This one, Chopin's Farewell Waltz. This one from generic healing music. Look at this shape produced by the Kawachi folk dance. This one shows the result of heavy metal music. Like before, here is a comparison of metal and healing music. Emoto took the experiment a step further. He decided to look at the effect of human words and phrases spoken into the water and by writing these words down and taping them to the glass overnight. Here is thank you. Here is love and appreciation. This one shows the effects of you make me sick, I will kill you. Again, a comparison. Very different geometric forms through intention. Here is a photo of very polluted water from the Fujiwara Dam. Here now is the same water, but after a prayer is spoken to it. Prayer, sound coupled with intention, has literally changed the water's entire molecular structure. Emoto's work not only demonstrates the diversity of the molecular structure of water and the effects of the environment on the water itself, but that sound frequency and vibration has a strong effect on its structure. Considering our bodies are composed of at least 80% water, perhaps we should be a little bit more careful as to the sounds we expose ourselves to. But this is where it gets really interesting. There is a field of activity called somatics which applies different sounds and vibrational frequencies to matter and water. In somatics, a metal plate called a cladney plate attaches to the top of a speaker. If you spread sand across the top and play different frequencies, it produces some very interesting results. The same experiment can be applied to water bowls. Look.
You already know where I am going with this. So watch. I know what you want to say. That's great, but it doesn't actually explain what the stars and planets are. And if there is water up there, then why is the entire firmament not vibrating with such light patterns? Have a little look at what they were able to produce in a lab. This star in a jar is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. And this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. First it expands, 
then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. You see, it is highly likely that the actual firmament is made from some kind of electromagnetic medium and its frequencies generate pockets of somnolescence that display the vibrational frequency of the firmament through their dancing shifting sacred geometry and color shifting light frequency. Yes, that's right, color has its own designated frequencies. And is this why in the Hunger Games, the heroes are able to deactivate the dome above them by disrupting its electrical current? Again, hidden in plain sight. The force field a dome right at the edge of the arena and it is very interesting that like reference to the firmament the ancient biblical texts of our world offer insight into the origins of the earth's creation and all matter in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and god said let there be light and there was light god saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and it was good. You see, the emphasis here is on God's word. God spoke the world into being, and it was so. Words, speech, sound, vibration. Whether God is a man-like being, I do not know. But in light of the way vibration and frequencies influence the entire shape and formation of matter, we can see that this passage is most likely very accurate. And it really is a case of understanding the micro and the macro, from the tiniest to the largest. Just like the small amounts of water contained within a bowl can resonate beautiful geometric shapes, so do the stars. Have a closer look at this somatic sound pattern produced by frequency. This is exactly the same shape and formation we see in conceptual representations of the flat earth in the United Nations and Gleason's map. Again, the micro and then the macro. It is vibration and frequency governing the shape and form of matter. Perhaps crop circles with their perfect geometry form from strong vibrational bursts from somewhere above, just in the same way that shapes form in frozen water. When applying somatics to the dolphin's sonic communication, we see similar geometric shapes. They are even starting to compile a dolphin alphabet from this. And you see the same geometry in nerve cell regeneration. Again, the micro and the macro. God spoke and it was so. But we need to pause. We are only focusing on the mechanisms of our electromagnetic world of frequency and vibration right now. We will address the why this is all here and how it came to be in, in a later episode. Electromagnetism also perfectly explains how our sun and moon work on flat earth. As mentioned previously, the sun and moon are not spherical bodies of rock or gas. They are disks that rotate our earth much like a clock but in a coil-like spiral dictating the seasons and climates as they go. When the sun is beyond the equator ring, the northern hemisphere experiences summer and the southern hemisphere experiences winter. Inversely, when below the equator, the southern hemisphere experiences summer and the northern hemisphere experiences winter. But up until this point, we have not explored how our celestial bodies of light can actually travel in such a clockwork fashion. And as gravity is a hoax, this mechanism becomes even more mysterious. But again, electromagnetism and engineering holds the answer. We are told that the Earth's magnetic field extends from Earth's interior out into space, 
where it interacts with solar wind, a stream of charged particles emanating from the sun. We are told that the Earth tilts on an axis, and it is as if there was an enormous bar magnet placed at an angle through the centre of the Earth. Mostly, this is all lies, but there is a strong magnetic presence on Earth, and it appears to be located in the north, and that's why compasses point north. On our flat plane, however, north is actually centre. South is the entire continent of Antarctica, the ice wall, and east and west, the circular rotation around the north centre with the south on its exterior. That's why it can seem that you are traversing the entire Earth when travelling east in a straight line. You end up where you started not because the Earth is a globe and you are travelling in a straight line, but because when you keep the compass pointing to the east, you are in effect travelling in a circle. Let's now have a look at electric motors. Magnetism, you will know that the opposite poles of magnets attract and the like poles repel. You may also know that a magnetic field appears when current flows in a conductor. Briefly connecting this wire to a battery deflects the compass's needle. Electricity creates a magnetic field. This effect can be used to create an electromagnet. This coil is the electromagnet in our simple motor. Connecting a AA battery, we can see the magnetic force from the coil moving the magnet in the compass. The coil is polarized. One side is north, the other is south. Let's start construction of our motor by creating the coil. Slide the permanent magnet into place. It doesn't matter which pole is up. Touching the leads to a single AA battery should cause the coil to bounce. If the coil is balanced and all electrical connections are completed, the motor should start. This is a commercially made DC motor. It is significantly more powerful and efficient than our simple motor. It accomplishes this with strong permanent magnets and large coils wound on an armature, and a method for controlling the polarity of the coil's magnetic field. As you can see, Electric current produces a magnetic field. Inversely, magnetic fields can also be used to make electric currents. It works both ways. What came first in terms of Earth is really a matter of the chicken and the egg, and we will explore this and the source of magnetism in a later episode. To understand how the Sun and Moon function as electromagnetic luminaries, it is necessary to look at the Faraday effect. Let's switch it on, let's see what yeah, it does. Cool. Through this coil of thick wire, we're about to pass a huge alternating electric current. On top is a one kilogram aluminium plate. So we hear this noise, what's that noise? It's the vibration of the plate, because it's vibrating at uh, two times the frequency of this, of this, of this Wha one. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> How does it do that? To find out, I've come to the place where it all started, the Royal Institution in London. This is the key to Faraday's magnetic lab. It's amazing that that lock still works. From the 1870s on, this became a storeroom, which is why it survived, and it survived intact, all the joinery, giant electromagnet, uh, exactly the same as Faraday. Uh, so this is it. exactly as Faraday would have had. That's right, yep. In Faraday's time, it was known that electric current creates a magnetic field. But it remained an open question whether the reverse is possible, if a magnetic field could generate electric current. Faraday answered this question with his most famous apparatus. Faraday's electromagnetic induction ring, which is this. In August 1831, Faraday wrapped two coils of insulated wire around this iron ring. But in 1831, you could not go down to your local electrical hardware shop and ask for 600 meters of insulated wire. You had to insulate the wire as you went, and so as you pushed and pulled the wire out of the ring, you had to insulate it. It takes 10 working days, which is a huge investment of time. But the investment paid off. When Faraday connected a battery to one of the coils, he saw a brief pulse of current in the other coil. And when he disconnected the battery, he saw a pulse of current in the other direction. He realized that current was induced in the second coil only when the magnetic field through it was changing. And if they hadn't been wrapped on the same ring, Faraday may have noticed that the two coils repel each other, when the current is induced, and that's due to the interaction of their magnetic fields. Which brings us back to this. 
Through the bottom coil, we are passing a huge electric current, 800 amps, which alternates in direction 900 times per second. This ensures there will always be a changing magnetic field above the coil. Instead of a second coil, we're using the aluminum plate, but the principle is the same. The changing magnetic field induces currents in the plate that create an opposing magnetic field, so it levitates. Oh. <laughs> How awesome is that? The opposing electromagnetic fields here cause the plate to levitate. Really think about it. If gravity actually existed and was such a powerful force, then this would not be possible. The opposing electromagnetic fields cause the plate to lock or levitate. Gravity does not even enter the equation. Just pure, repeatable and demonstrable science. We can see the same thing here. It's of the magnets. You see, if I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because it makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. It's astonishing. Can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just levitate it above the track quite high. And I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating, it's locked above the surface. So it could you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, still fly around. Yeah, it could like this and it will just go around like this. Because it go and put it at different height and then like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. Okay. High. Doing the same so thing. Hang I'm locking down. it upside down and then it is suspended. The disc here is locked and can traverse uninterrupted over the circle of magnets. In the same way here we see it work inversely via quantum locking. 
the disc traverses locked underneath the magnets. This is how the sun and moon work on flat earth. They are locked via the earth's self-generating magnetic fields and which takes the form of a spiral coil. And I know you're probably thinking that this is fascinating, but it still doesn't explain how the sun and moon luminaries are powered. We see them journey over our earthly plane, but how are they illuminating the earth? We don't see any wires. And this is where Tesla becomes important. The Tesla coil works in a similar way. As you can see here, the metal foil paper circles the Tesla coil tower in a circular motion due to electromagnetism. But the Tesla coil laid the foundations for wireless technology and what is called free energy. Tesla viewed the sun as an immense form of electricity, positively charged and with the potential of some 200 billion volts. As we have seen, a magnetic field can produce electrical currents, and in theory, with the right mechanical setup, we should be able to produce free energy. Of course, the satanic elite stop free energy because there is no money in it, and the progress we could make would pose a huge threat to the levers of control they have placed upon us. But Tesla was en route to inventing it. Look at this mini Tesla coil. You see, the light bulb is charged and illuminated without any wires. The intense magnetic field has produced an electrical current. So let's go back to the Faraday effect example and see what happens next. This current is not only good for levitating the plate, it can also make light bulbs glow. A gift. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> that is cool. Not, not too close because it uh, will... Uh Burn the, the, the arms. Can I put it there? Yeah. And just as current in a toaster element heats it up, the induced current in the plate dissipates its energy as heat. Some water. Thank you. Yeah, to see the, the temperature. Even. Check out how hot this plate is. Oh, that is nuts. Is this your favorite demo? It's like a flying barbecue or something. Tell me this is not the best dinner table centerpiece. It levitates, it gives you light, and you can cook on it. And all the while, you're demonstrating Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. The light bulbs are illuminated without any wiring because of the electromagnetic field. In essence, this picture here is our sun. Remember, the micro and the macro. And it opens a door to speculating on the nature of the moon. The sun and the moon are the same size. If the sun is positively charged, then could the moon be its negatively charged counterpart, like we see in a battery? Could that explain why the nature of moonlight is oppositional to sunlight? Or could the moon be an old malfunctioning sun? Perhaps that explains the lunar moon phases, or its waxing and waning. Is it trying to charge and generate enough power to become an intense positive charge luminary like the sun and as it generates to its full moon phase, it malfunctions and begins charging down or waning? The notion that our Earth is a flat plane disk isn't looking like such nonsensical drivel anymore, is it? Electrical energy, frequency and vibration is literally everywhere on Earth. It is omnipresent omnipotent and most likely omniscient and the earth functions as an energy plate much like what Tesla created with his purple energy plate or coil as an electromagnetic base. We are all used to magnificent frightening displays of electricity in our skies in the form of lightning but did you know that there is an entire electroscape above the clouds? Scientists took a plane above a huge electric storm to document this they call them sprites and elves. Look. As soon as it gets dark, thunder begins to reverberate around the airport. 
the researchers board the planes on what looks like a promising night. At 9 p.m., the two jets take off. They're heading for thunderclouds 120 miles away that are vigorously producing lightning. The cabin is in constant communication with Yair and Lyons at Yucca Ridge. Essentially, they want some kind of a central location. He evaluates the data and gives the pilots the latitude and longitude of large thunderclouds where sprites might appear. For reference, we'll be on this uh, data collection run for about 10 minutes. Did you get it? For an instant, a giant red flash appeared. On replay, they can see beautiful shafts of light thrusting upwards towards space. The mysterious sprite in all its glory. Then, the sprites keep coming. On board, the team reviews the stunning and unique images. This sprite was shaped like a mangrove tree. It's been captured in more detail than any sprite until now. Just like its name, this sprite evokes a fairy with wings. Oh my God. Yeah, very big jellyfish. It's pretty. Very pretty. It indeed looks like a jellyfish with many tentacles. Sprites of many different forms appear, one after another. Seen up close, they have a variety of shapes. Eventually, a sprite appears that demands special attention. This is spectacular. The umbrella-like top of this sprite... You can see that they are coming from the firmament above. In this still, you can actually see what looks like the surface of the firmament illuminating. This is most likely what causes thunder and lightning in the first place. Powerful bursts of electrical discharge from the electromagnetic firmament, which instills electricity into the clouds and atmosphere below, and which is then expressed in the form of lightning. Again, the ancient texts tell us this. And other things I saw concerning lightning, how some of the stars rise and become lightning, but cannot lose their form. It's been proven that lightning excites the Schumann resonance, the electromagnetic heartbeat of the Earth. Again, electrical energy, frequency and vibration is literally everywhere on Earth. Think about the oceans. Water is a well-established conductor of electricity. Seawater has a salinity of roughly 3.5%, which is composed primarily of sodium or salt. Sodium is one of the four electrolytes. Our bodies cannot survive without sufficient electrolytes. These electrical ions literally regulate our blood volume and pressure, our cells, muscles, hormones and organs. Look at an electrolytic cell and then a voltaic or battery cell. Both are very similar in nature and both look very similar to the models of flat earth itself. Again, the micro and the macro. Furthermore, look at someone who has been struck by lightning. Look at the scar. It looks like a tree or a tree's roots. Electricity, vibration and frequency again creating form. Trees are often exposed during storms. Could this be why the fruits that grow on trees are acidic in nature? Just like batteries contain battery acid? Water is also diamagnetic, meaning it repels a magnetic field. This explains the tides. The magnetic fields generated by the sun and the moon influence the movement, ebb and flow and height of the oceans as they journey above over our flat earth. This causes the oceans to fluctuate between high and low tides due to being repelled by magnetism and then released. Look.
Just like our voices influence the geometrical shape of water's molecular structure, God's voice formed our world. The earth and everything contained within it is a manifestation of divine sound. The evidence for creation is literally everywhere and the driving force is energy, vibration and frequency. We often think of the natural world as the antithesis to our cities that run on electricity. The reason our human generated energy feels so at odds with nature is because in many ways it is very unnatural. We are bombarded with very strong electromagnetic fields generated by cell towers, wireless internet and smartphones constantly. What the ball believers don't realize is that satellites are just another hoax. We are told that there are over 2000 satellites orbiting the earth, most of which exist within low earth orbit. So where are the satellites in the recent blue marble images? All our images of satellites are either computer animation or CGI. There is no cloud of information above us. The real cloud you see is under the ocean. As Time magazine has already told us, there are over 300 undersea cables and that they carry 99% of the world's intercontinent data. The rest of our data is carried by the thousands of cell towers everywhere. Cell towers are responsible for our wireless internet and smartphones via unnatural electromagnetic frequencies or what is known as EMFs. There are no satellites, it's just another lie and it seems like there is no end to their lies. There was a reason the satanic complex started panicking when theories arose that 5G was causing COVID-19. While this is not entirely true, it is irrefutable that the constant exposure to high EMFs is affecting our natural synchronization with the Earth's own electromagnetic field. Our bodies run on electrolytes and if we are continually exposing ourselves to high amounts of EMFs at such a close range, it will inevitably start affecting our health. Eventually the sodium calcium channels in our body will become dysfunctional and disease will occur. They panicked because the COVID-19 5G theory drew everyone's attention to the harmful effects of intense EMFs on our bodies. And it isn't just us. Recently scientists are becoming aware that our cell towers, which generate vast amounts of EMFs, are beginning to affect the birds, trees and insects. An example of this is the bumblebee. The artificial and abundant electromagnetic waves from our proliferating grid of wireless technology is not only disturbing the bee's natural navigation abilities, the bee navigates via magnetic fields, but it is also causing bee populations to decline worldwide. This is a real shame, as it is the bumblebee that holds the key to unlocking one of the biggest secrets of all time. So enormous in size it is on par with the firmament. I need you to fasten your seatbelts and follow me to the next episode. What I am about to show you has the potential to change your entire perspective of our world forever.